Are you ready, Ninja Babe? Ready to face your fears, to ignite your passions and break through your limitations? Are you ready to get out of your comfort zone and go after your dreams with unstoppable force? It's happening here on the Ninja Babes podcast, the place where women spill it all about self-confidence, courage, and body image. This is where we show our strength. This is the sisterhood where girls gather to empower themselves and each other. Get ready to get rocked because this is where you come to be encouraged and be transformed in order to live out your full potential. Be proud of yourself, Ninja Babe. Now let's get after it. Hey, and welcome to the Ninja Babes podcast. I'm excited for episode number 52, and I'm here today with Haley Shapley, and she is different from our other Ninja Babes that we've had on the show before. She is actually an author, and she has written Strong Like Her, and I'm super inspired by this book, and one of our own, Maggie Thorne, is featured in the book. So I'm really excited to have the creator with us today to share about her story and what motivated her to write the book, what is the book all about, and why you're going to love it. So Haley, hello and welcome. Thank you for having me as an honorary ninja babe. Yes, you are an honorary ninja babe. (laughs) And like when you write about something that's as close to home for all of us as women's strength and athleticism, it's like you are, you're just in it. You're in it for life now. (laughs) Ah, thank you. That's exciting for me. Oh, yeah. So Where are you from? Have you been an author for a long time? Like, tell us a little bit more about your background. Sure. I'm a journalist based in Seattle, and this is my first book. So previous to now, I have mostly written for magazines and websites and newspapers focused on short articles. Um, So this is my first deep dive into a topic. Um, And I've written Strong Like Her, which is a cultural history that explores women and physical strength. It starts in ancient times and goes all the way through today. That's really cool. I love the concept too, because, you know, I listened to um, like the intro audio online and it was, it went all the way back to times talking about like the, the first Olympics and like all of that, not Olympics as we know it, but back in Greece and like all of every, all the events that were going on there. And it was just so interesting to hear just about women not being invited. And could you tell us more about like that intro that you had, had included there? Yes. So the book starts um, in ancient Greece and with some of the uh, mythical characters that ancient Greece had as well, um, such as Atalanta, who was a a strong woman. And um, I get it into the Amazons as well. And whether those were fictitious characters or based on real life warriors. Oh, wow. That's super neat. And you had mentioned to me even before we started recording that you used to work in journalism. So what, what kind of inspired you to write? Was it this desire to research and like go after this group of like strong women like back in the day or what what made you even want to write this that's a great question it was a combination of things I felt like everywhere I looked I was seeing women who were strong on social media and on tv like with American Ninja Warrior and it seemed to me like being strong was cooler for women than ever before But I wanted to know if that was actually true. So I was curious to see how athleticism and strength training had evolved for women. Um, So I went to my local library and I checked out a bunch of books on the history of fitness. And I found that there were so few pages in those books devoted to women. And that's when I realized I had a great book idea on my hands because this hadn't really been covered before. Yeah. I'm wondering what you found in those pages or like the few pages that you could find were those women considered like oddities or like, you know what I mean? Like very rare? Sometimes it depended on the the time and um, sort of the activity for each woman. I think a lot of the women who were able to become famous for um, sports in earlier years had some quality that made them accepted by the general public. Um Often their athleticism was framed within the confines of femininity. So, for example, I feature a circus star named Sandwina, and she could lift three men at a time. She could juggle cannonballs. She could break chains. She was very, very strong, and she came from a a family of circus performers. So this was in her family. This was in her genes. But when newspapers focused on her, they always talked about her womanly curves, um, her beautiful face, 
how she was a mother. She gave a lot of parenting advice. So her strength was accepted, but it was, people were still always being reminded that she was um, this mother, a wife, that she was still fitting in with the um, kind of socially accepted definition of what a woman should be. Wow. So it's almost like they had to find a way to like qualify it or like balance it with balance her masculine, so to say, like I'm air quoting masculine qualities with her feminine qualities. Exactly. And I have just um, a whole collection of magazine articles that do that throughout all eras. There's always this qualification with women, like you just said. So there was an article in the 1970s about a woman named Jan Todd, who was a power lifter and um, one of the strongest women in the world. And the article goes into great depth about her looks, the fact that she cooks, like you would think she doesn't bake, but she does. And so we see that with you know, throughout history that people go out of their way to highlight those feminine characteristics if they are going to highlight anything that they might think is traditionally masculine. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's it's interesting also like in the ninja world, a lot of us women athletes are always talking about just we we feel like the more that we so to say can normalize the fact that women are strong and women can go after these feats the more that will just be helping to send like a ripple effect out into the rest of society and the rest of culture, just people accepting it and realizing that it's not an exception to the rule or it's not like a, oh, she's a woman and she's strong or she's strong, but she's a woman. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. having to have that weird like additive in there. And even with Ninja Warrior, it's something that comes up a lot because in gyms or in the community at large, there's always recognition for women when they make certain accolades so for example it's like who is the first woman to get the war ball who is the first woman to get this obstacle or that obstacle and we always note how sometimes it's not just like who was the first athlete to get it it was like oh the guys have already done this for a long time but who is the first woman and you know those things are important to note and they're definitely like great celebrations and we're excited about those but we look forward to the day when it's not just like oh, the guys have all gotten this already, but oh, finally the first woman got it. But it's more so an equal you know, balance of who was the first athlete? Mm-hmm. Oh, it was so-and-so, whether it was a guy or a girl, just like focusing on athleticism itself and not just like what was men's, what was this guy's accomplishment? What was this woman's accomplishment? Right. That makes sense. Um, and that's tricky because I know in Ninja for a lot of the obstacles, it has taken women a little bit longer to be able to conquer some of them. So you want to celebrate them. But at the same time, I know so many women love the fact that they compete on a course that is, uh, you know, that's gender neutral. And, um, and so just being able to see women as athletes and not that qualifier of female athletes is an important thing to work toward. Yeah. And it's a sticky subject in our, in our, world. I don't know how, how much you, it seems like you know a lot about Ninja Warrior. I'm a fangirl for sure. So yes, I yeah. I went to a taping last year and the people in the stands were like asking questions oh. of each other and I would just, I just had to butt in and be like, I know who that is. Here's what they've accomplished the past three years. This is why they're like, you know, they haven't made it up the warped wall or whatever. So yes, I I, I love the show. It's it's fantastic. Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That's awesome to hear. I'm, I'm glad that you truly are a ninja babe. See, you're just... <laughs> I'm just a non-competitive um, ninja babe, but one day maybe. Yeah. It's been a sticky subject within our community, especially the past um, 10 months or so, just really looking at different uh, groups within Ninja Warrior that have evolved, like UNX, for example, um, and they've had separate courses for men and women. And I had Jesse Graff and Jess Lebrecht on the podcast talking about this decision to have separate courses and what did that look like? What did it mean? What kind of uh, message was that sending to younger girls and all these things? And, you know, we we were, I would say, kind of divided, not necessarily on that episode. I mean, I feel like we were trying to dig into all the different perspectives, but the reaction or the response from like the women's community at large was a bit divided as far as is this good is this bad um what does this mean and 
it's just interesting because, you know, we want to be able to have courses that women can complete, but we don't want to send a message that we're dumbing them down or making them easier just Mm -hmm. for the women. We're trying to find a different type of course that is more suited to women's skills. But then it's like, what do you mean by that? You know, it's been this back and forth conversation for months and months trying to discuss and like really figure out what's the best way for us to go about this. But at the same time, it's like, you know, if A&W was like, okay, we're going to have separate courses now, I think we would all be livid. Like everyone would be. So, you know, it's, it's hard to just say like what the right answer is. But um, I think, you know, we've always loved being on the same exact course, especially on A&W on a national, you know, worldwide platform, being able to show our skills and show like we can do this. And yeah, I mean, like you said, like it's been longer for women to make some of those same accomplishments that the guys have made of getting up the wall, getting to stage one and all these things. Um, but we're getting there and every year, like the women are stronger and, you know, new talent arises. And it's just so cool to be a part of this movement that's growing and growing every year. And, and in our local communities, like we see the strength of women like everywhere. And it's just so, so cool to see. Yeah. And I think it just takes examples too, right? Like how many people got into Ninja Warrior after seeing Casey Catanzaro finish the city finals course and how many people have been inspired Mm -hmm. by both Jessie's and um, by Barclay Stockett and all of these other women who have shown that it's possible to do certain obstacles or to finish a course. So the more women see that it's possible, the more who will try it and actually believe that it's something that's possible for them. So I think we'll continue to see um, women improving. Definitely. It makes me think of the cover of your book. Um, It says a celebration of rule breakers, history makers, and unstoppable athletes. Like that is so cool to hear. And um, like, what made you choose that phrase to showcase on your book? We went through a lot of different phrases, but um, we settled on that one because most of the women I profile in the book um, were doing something that was against the norm. They were going against the cultural ideas of femininity at their time and pushing the boundaries of their own strength. And we also considered using um, the term everyday women uh, because although most of the women I profile in the book um, are really exceptional athletes, there are some, including myself, who are kind of regular people. Um, and I think that there are benefits to being physically strong, even if you're not someone who's going to set a world record. Uh, but but back to the idea of rule breakers, history makers, and unstoppable athletes, I just really wanted to emphasize that these are women who are doing something outside the norm and making their own rules for it. Yeah, and that definitely resonates with all of us in the ninja world of just breaking those rules, you know, the cultural norms of, oh, woman's never done this. Well, now we're going to do it and you're going to see us do it. Um, and just so many of us have, have taken that story and that whole co- like concept of what does it mean to be a ninja warrior or, you know, in our community, what does it mean to be a ninja babe? And just apply that to every area of life, like being fearless in what we do and being willing to you know, quit jobs and start our own businesses or, you know, open ninja gyms and do all these different things. And so I, I love that. I'm, I'm super excited about your book because I just feel like the whole title is, is us, it's it's our community. And so, you know, and having Maggie Thorne in it is really exciting to look forward to. How did you get in contact with Maggie? Did you know her already? I didn't know Maggie. I knew I wanted a ninja warrior in the book because I do think it has been, um, a huge, part of little girls thinking it's cool to be strong now and and other and women thinking it's cool and men respecting women's strength and it's just a big part of um of our culture so i wanted a ninja warrior and i felt like maggie just has this really positive presence and i love how supportive she is of all the other ninjas and i i think that's one of the cool things about the sport is that everyone seems so invested in each other's success so I reached out to Maggie and she was immediately interested in participating, which I was grateful for. And she asked if she could um, bring along her daughter, Fiona. And I said, sure. And so uh, we have a really nice um, moment in the book with them where it's a, they're in a photo together as mother and daughter. Um, And I think it's just cool to show that 
moms can set that example for their kids. And it's a powerful example to see. Yeah, that's so encouraging and so cool. I'm really glad that she was able to be a part of it. And yeah, Maggie is an an excellent example of someone who has so much strength, like inside and outside. And she, her journey and just like the way that she's gone after her goals and kept her family strong together and just everything is incredible. Yeah, she's... I was going to say I met Maggie early on um, before I even knew who she was. Like I, I didn't watch the show for forever before I got involved with Ninja. I got, a, got involved on a whim. And so when I met her, I didn't realize who she was, but I did see all these little girls like <laughs> swarming her. And I was like, oh, I guess this is someone I should know. And, you know, just getting to know her and her story has been really incredible, like so many other ninjas. So were there any other ninja warriors who were involved in the making of Strong Like Her? There are some more ninja connections. Uh, I interviewed Barclay Stockett for the book, and she provides some great insight on what it was like to grow up as a girl who could hang with the boys um, and what it's like to compete in a sport that is, in general, not built for someone who's five feet tall. Um, She says something really cool about how it's hard work, but she loves hard work, so it's not a negative for her. And I love that positive mindset that she brings to it. And then I also, a couple of the other featured athletes who have portraits in the book um, have competed on a ninja show at one point. Uh, Sydney Olson is a free runner based in LA. And I know um, she's been on Team Ninja Warrior and has competed. And Demaya Smith is a teenager and an all around amazing athlete um, in Oklahoma who is. a state champion in powerlifting. She's just taken up wrestling. She also plays basketball and runs track. So she does all kinds of things. Um, and she competed on the first season of American Ninja Warrior Junior. Amazing. I'm so, it's so cool to hear that all these other women were involved as well. And it's just awesome. Like the range of talent and ability and strength in our community is just outstanding. I love it. I'm so glad they were in there as well. Yeah, it was, there are lots of connections um, because I think it's a sport that has a lot of different athletic qualities related to it. So you see people from many different backgrounds. Definitely. Yeah, the the backgrounds are everything from gymnastics to track and field to absolutely nothing. (laughs) So, yeah. Yes. And just like so many ninjas have different stories. I feature 23 modern day athletes in the book and they all have very different stories as well. So I think there's something relatable for everyone who picks this up to read one of these stories and find something in it that they think, gosh, this applies to me or I can learn something from this. So she has um, just one of those stories, but I love how she, uh, you know, she wasn't really athletic when she was younger, but a gym teacher noticed that she looked like she might be good at track and she was off and running from there. And it really changed the course of her life to get involved with sports. Uh, So I, I love what she shares in the book. Are there other, I'm sure you love every single person's story. I don't want to ask you to pick a favorite, (laughs) but um, is there one or two other stories that really stand out to you that you could tell us about? Oh, it's really hard to pick favorites because I know I I don't want you to pick they're like my children. No. Um, One story I like that's a historic story is from Pudgy Stockton. She was a weightlifter um, on Muscle Beach in the 1930s and 40s. And Pudgy was um, just a regular, regular girl. She graduated from high school and started working at a telephone company as a telephone operator. And she didn't like the way that she felt because she was sedentary. Um, So she wanted to work out, but she couldn't find very much information on fitness for women. So she let her boyfriend at the time come up with a little weight training plan for her. And she decided to, to try it. She wasn't sure if she liked it, but she immediately liked it. And she started to go to Muscle Beach and work on um, doing a handstand and acrobatics. And eventually she was very strong. And she started to write a column in Strength and Health magazine um, that encouraged women to start strength training. Um, And she did that for a decade. And she was just one of those examples. People would see her 
working out and she always had a smile on her face. She was always radiating joy and it looked like something appealing. It looked like something that they might want to try. And unlike some of the strong women who had come before, who, uh, like I mentioned, uh, Sandwina, who was the circus performer, she was born into this and she was about six feet tall. And, you know, she had a very sturdy build and Pudgy was five, two, you know, she was petite and she wasn't someone you would look at and immediately say, oh, that woman can hold a handstanding ban above her head. Um, but she could. So she was someone who inspired both men and women to take um, charge of their own physical health. And I just really enjoyed learning about her and the legacy that she set because she was kind of the start for a lot of the women who then got into weightlifting and powerlifting in the 70s, which is when it really started in the U.S. for women. Wow, how cool is that? I'm thinking of so many, you know, people I follow on Instagram too, who that's their world is over there on Muscle Beach and what they do. And to think that someone, you know, really paved the way for for these women to be able to continue in her legacy of working out there and like strength training and, you know, the acrobatics on the beach. Like, it's so, so cool to, to learn that history. And it was a really interesting time when, so the original Muscle Beach was in Santa Monica. It's in Venice today. So it moved mm -hmm. a little bit, but back in the day, it was um, during the Great Depression is when it started and then kind of went into World War II. And this was a tough time in history. And the community at Muscle Beach really gave people a lot of hope. Um, it wasn't just entertainment. It, it was sort of encompassed something bigger than that. So what was interesting for me in this book was being able to explore those larger themes that go beyond just here's what one person accomplished. You know, this person put 300 pounds over their head. Okay, great. What does that mean in a larger context? Um, so that's one of the things I get to tease out in these stories. Yeah, that's so valuable to, and just to realize that during that time, I'm sure one of the reasons that it started on the beach was just, it was free. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that during the depression, like people did not have money. I don't know if gym memberships were a thing, but I would imagine that it, that uh, the equipment outside was shared. It was something that people could just go and do, or was there more to it than that? Yeah. So the equipment that was put there was actually because of the depression. So there had been a, an earthquake in California that had ruined a lot of the um, schools. And so there was a teacher, a playground instructor, who suggested that they put some equipment on this beach so that school kids could come and, and have a place to play. And other people were attracted to that equipment because they were looking for things to do. So there's a few origin stories of how the beach started, but that is um, the one that I've heard the most. Um, and you mentioned gym memberships. Gyms were not a thing at the time, really, but they started out of this era. So a lot of the contemporaries who Pudgy was working out with were people who went on to start a lot of gym culture things we know about. So uh, Joe Gold was on the gym and, and he was the founder of Gold's Gyms. And Jack LaLanne was on the beach and he was, um, you know, someone who inspired a lot of people to start working out. And Vic Tanny was on the beach and he started the Modern Health Club. So this era brought forth a lot of well-known people in the world of physical culture. Wow, this could be a podcast episode all on its own. <laughs> yeah, it really could. That's so interesting. And it is a chapter of its own in my book. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. What's up, Ninja Babes? I'm Maria Rella, your Ninja Babes podcast editor. This Saturday, April 25th, Kara and her amazing physical therapist, Dr. Giancarlo Rosan, will be hosting a shoulder seminar on Zoom. You all know how Kara has come back from labrum surgery even stronger. Now you can learn about how she did it and how to prevent injury in the first place. Topics include shoulder strengthening and mobility, what to do if you have a shoulder injury, warning signs you are overtraining, and a Q&A about the journey from dislocation to complete recovery. 
As someone who is working hard to get their first pull up, I'm excited to gain the knowledge that will help me get to my pull up safely and prevent future injury. There are two sessions of the seminar, Saturday, April 25th from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Time and 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time or 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on the 26th for all you Aussie fans out there. It's a pay what you want, either four, eight, or $16. I'll be at the 12 p.m. session and I hope to see you there, Ninja Babes. Ninja Babe, I believe in you. I'm so glad that you're part of this community. I'm so glad that you're listening to this episode. Ninja Babes is the thing because we believe in this community. We believe in this sisterhood and we want you to feel that strength coming from your girls. We want you to know that we are here for you. I believe in your ability to succeed in your dreams. I believe that you can continue to grow in your ninja skills and your goals and all of your fitness dreams and all the things you wanna go after. And also in the rest of your life, your mindset changes every single time that you step into that ninja gym and you learn about your own fears and your own challenges and your own strengths you grow in so many ways and it changes your your brain. It changes the way that you think about yourself. It changes the way that you see other people. And when we're able to continue to form this community and to support one another, it's just completely life-changing if you give it a chance and you open yourself up to having courage and to going after your dreams. If you wanna give back and support this community in a deeper way, give to our Patreon. Through Patreon, you can donate to Ninja Babes, and you can even become a partner with Ninja Babes. And so the reason to give back, it's up to you. What does Ninja Babes mean to you? What has it meant to you? When you give to Ninja Babes, you're helping us to produce more content, to keep the podcast going. You're helping our team have the ability to, to edit, to produce videos, to do all the technical things that takes hours and hours to do every week. And we want to continue to produce content for you and to make meaningful um, teachings and share those meaningful stories and so give back to us as we continue to support you and if you support on the patreon you will receive gifts from us you'll be getting monthly content that is exclusive to that patreon community it's mindset content that's going to rock your world and there's also some really really cool gifts on there there's the girl gang ninja babes patches for your jean jacket or your gym bag and then there's some really awesome stainless steel drinking bottles on there and also the Ninja Babe sports bras. Those are all only available through Patreon. So give your gift and show your support and get your exclusive Ninja Babe Girl Gang swag. So I know you explained like why you started the book and like why you started your research, but I would imagine that through your process of researching and, and digging up all of this history and these stories and meeting people from today as well, what did that process feel like for you? Did it feel emotional or did it you know, evoke anything new or deep in you? That's a great question. Um, It was an incredible experience. And for me, it was really exciting because um, I mentioned earlier, I've been a writer for my entire career, but I mostly focused on articles that take a couple of days or a couple of weeks as opposed to a couple of years. So it was very gratifying for me to get to explore a topic so deeply and a topic that means something to me. Um, And I'm someone who just loves to learn. So the research portion was really fascinating. And um, I now am really enjoying having the opportunity to talk to people like you and other readers about the book because I do care about these topics so much. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love it. I'm so glad that you wrote the book. (laughs) Thank you. It's exciting that it's out because this... I got the idea a little over three years ago, which isn't terribly long in the book world, but it felt like a long time while I was working on it. So the fact that it's um, it's now something that I can share with people and really have discussions about just feels kind of surreal sometimes. So it's exciting that strangers are sending me messages about it, and it's really humbling, and, and I'm excited that I had the opportunity. Definitely. How do you feel like you see the power of women, whether you want to compare it to how you saw it before writing the book and then after, or just in general, I love hearing your perspective. And what can you say about how you see the power of women? I think women are incredibly powerful. That's number one. And they don't always know it or believe it. Um, I cover a few studies in the book that show that when athletes believe they're being given steroids, they're able to lift more weight. 
And I think most of us know that our mindset is incredibly important in whatever we do, but I'm not sure we realize just how big of a role it plays. So I think that women really understanding and believing that they're powerful can lead to incredible things. And I knew that before I wrote the book, and I know that now, Um, but getting a chance to dig into that more is something I've enjoyed. Mindset is something we talk about all the time through Ninja Babes and just through Ninja Ninja Warrior in general. Um, And it's so true, just what you believe about yourself and what you believe you are able to do has such a strong effect on what happens in our lives. And I love that. I love that you touch on that. And that's a belief that we share. Yes, absolutely. And it's something I even struggle with myself. Like I've even unconsciously or subconsciously, like we've all gotten messages from the time that we were young about what we could do that maybe we didn't even realize we were getting. And that's something that I've been examining in my own life. What have I been told wasn't for me that could be for me if I wanted it to be? Um, So I hope that's something that people think about as they're reading. Yes, absolutely. It's always good to question your own thoughts, you know, just like, oh, I don't think I could do this. Well, why? Is that something that uh, someone told me and I've just always counted as true for myself? Or is it something that I just felt was true because it's what I saw? Um, And so you're so right. Just being able to really analyze those thoughts and like think through them can be the difference between you know, changing your world and like going after something new and seeing that accomplishment or just never even trying and like never seeing anything fruitful come of it. Right. Absolutely. um, Can you tell us where can we find your book? And I want everyone to get this book in their hands. So tell us where are you on Instagram? Where can people find the book and all that good stuff? The book is out wherever books are sold. It's a little tricky right now, obviously, with everything going on in the world, but um, it's available from indie bookstores. So if there's one near you that you want to order through that's still um, that's still sending out books, a lot of shops are doing free shipping right now, which is great. Um, and it's available from online retailers as well. And I'm on Instagram at Haley Shapley, as well as Twitter at Haley Shapley. And my website is HaleyShapley.com. So all pretty simple, just my name. Um, And on Instagram, I've been posting some alternate shots of the athletes, which is some kind of cool bonus content um, if you want to check that out. Oh, yeah. I love that. It's like behind the scenes. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm going to be posting more behind the scenes stuff, too. So I'll have um, I'll have some of that as well. Definitely. We'll keep directing our Ninja Babes community to everything you're posting. And we would love to stay connected with you. I hope that I can meet you one day at a Ninja Warrior filming. Yes, I would love that. That would be so fun. I love the Ninja Babes community so much that I'd I'd love to give out a a copy of the book to someone. Yes, that would be amazing. We love giveaways here in the Ninja Babes world. Um, So yeah, for one lucky listener, who we will definitely be giving away a, or I won't be giving away, but Haley will be giving away uh, a copy of Strong Like Her. So if you would love to get one of those, stay tuned on the Ninja Babes page to see the details about the giveaway. Haley, it was lovely having you on here. I'm so excited to meet you and to hear about Strong Like Her. And just thank you for sharing all of your wisdom. Yeah, thanks so much. Be strong. Be you. Be a Ninja Babe.